Welcome back to Mike on Money. My name is Michael LeBlanc, Director and Senior Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Junior Wealth Management. And thanks everyone for joining us again this week uh, where we talk about the markets, everything that's happening, everything we see up and coming. And today we're going to talk about bull versus bears. Basically, we're hearing a lot of uh, obviously concern around valuations in the markets these days. We've had a pretty good run over the last year. Uh, but also a lot of signs of uh, continued growth in the market and continued economic recovery. So what does that mean to a portfolio? What does it mean to our investment? And how do we interpret all these things? And so we're going to dive into that this week after we take a look at what's going on. And as always, keep in mind, everything we cover here is for information purposes only. Um, <clears throat> always do your own due diligence or reach out to us. Go to mikeonmoney.com if you want to get a hold of us our portal there, uh, lots more information, our podcasts and videos are all there as well, or links to those. <clears throat> and uh, always just make sure you, 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 uh, you take the information to make sure it's appropriate for your situation before acting on any, any strategy or advice in your, uh, in your portfolios. With that, if you're watching us live this week, uh, click on that Q&A button if you have any questions. If you're watching the, the recorded or the podcast, as I mentioned, go to mikeonmoney.com. Send me your questions. We'll definitely answer those there. I'd love to hear any feedback on uh, topics you'd like us to take a deep dive in or cover in more detail. Um, we, we always like to hear what you think and any ideas that you may have or just what's of interest to you uh, just to make sure things are current. So with that, let's jump, jump in, sorry, into what's been going on. Uh, and uh, we're starting to see this, um, this, 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 the underwriters, the insurance companies, uh, you know, trying to puzzle, trying to manage as we come out of this pandemic, or at least start to see some of the light at the end of this pandemic. We're starting to see the, uh, the insurers, underwriters, uh, trying to figure out how they're going to insure against this again. Obviously, uh, not just individual insurance, corporate insurances, uh, travel insurance, all different, it, it affected so many different aspects of the economy. Uh, people and corporations are looking for ways to protect themselves uh, should this happen again. And of course, the insurance companies want to know how they're going to underwrite this, how they're going to price it, how, uh, you know, how do they offer something out there to, um, to, you know, to provide that protection to the economy or to the people uh, and, and still, of course, not lose their shirts should this happen again in, in, in short, short time. And all evidence is pointed to, uh, we will see another one of these, uh, whether it's uh, two years down the road or 10 years down the road or hopefully longer, who knows? Uh, obviously, this one was kind of foreseen with uh, the progression of, um, you know, SARS, Mars, you, you know, the, the, the coronavirus itself um, was not new. It's just this particular strain of the coronavirus um, ended up being the, the pandemic virus. So could we see another one? Obviously, that's why countries around the world are racing to get the vaccines rolled out, get herd immunity rolled out to prevent that mutation. We've already seen some of those mutations become stronger and more, more infectious. Uh, India, of course, is going through uh, you know, a really tough time now. And it's not even our countries, right? Um, Canada, the US, UK, EU, you know, this is the big battle we're seeing is the developed countries. Yes, they're making a big push for the vaccines. They're making them available. They're making them free. <clears throat> you know, all things are great. Um, when you look at it from that front, but until we get the world vaccinated, right? Because we could get everything done, uh, and then a Canadian, an American, you know, uh, someone from the UK can get on a plane and go to a country that didn't have the means, didn't get access to the vaccines, and uh, a stronger, newer, more mutated strain could have developed there, and then all, you know, they bring it back, and we're all back in the same boat again. So. We're talking about global vaccination or global herd immunity in order to really just stop this one. So how are the insurance companies going to deal with this going forward? 
uh, is going to be a big thing on the plate. And, uh, and I think we need to keep a really close eye when we look at those, those firms um, as far as how they're going to price and what they're going to offer. Because whoever figures it out or, or, or you know, gets it right, obviously there's going to be a big market there. So a lot of potential, uh, but also a lot of risk if you get it wrong. Uh, on the oil front, uh, buying oil has started to accelerate. Uh, obviously, with confidence growing that the economy is going to open and recover uh, even faster. We're starting to see in China, um, you know, recovering a bit faster than, than the U.S. or, you know, kind of the two big gauges we're looking at right now, but you know, the rest of the world. But optimism is there, and we're looking for more price rebounds and it's remained strong. A uh, low-carbon world needs about... 1.7 trillion in mining investments. So this goes to those new technologies we've been talking about around clean tech, um, you know, requires certain metals. Copper for sure is the main conductor used in all these, uh, all, all most clean tech conducting electricity, if you want to look at it that way. Cobalt, nickel, of course, in the metallurgy work to, to achieve these things. Uh, and other metals are significantly needed in a low carbon world. So a lot more money being spent around the materials sector. Uh, we've already seen that sector performing well. There's obviously a lot of room there to grow. Uh, we've talked about this since late last year. It's definitely an area to keep, to keep your eye on. It is more cyclical. There is more movement. Whenever you have a commodity pricing base in, in any sector, um, you're, sus you're susceptible to that commodity price movement. Um, but obviously, as demand continues to grow, there's going to be a lot of expansion in that area. So definitely worthwhile keeping uh, exposures to it, uh, but keeping an eye on it as well. Uh, Biden is, uh, is moving to, uh, actually, this is a bit more controversial, I think. It was, a, it was kind of big in the headlines, um, but my interpretation of this. So Biden is saying the unemployed, if they're offered jobs, they have to take them or they potentially lose their unemployment benefits. Uh, so obviously a lot of criticism, uh, you know, kind of around people around the COVID um, relief bills and, 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 you know, Americans out there looking for new jobs, you know, if they get offered one, but it's not right for them, if they turn that down, do they lose benefits? You know, it, it's a fine line. Um, and the, the reason I say I'm not sure if it's as controversial as it, it was meant to be by, by President Biden, but the... Uh, in the U.S., their EI or their unemployment um, insurance is actually state run. It's not federally run. Uh, so every state has different rules. And, and, and there's 53, you know, if you include the Virgin Islands and, and uh, Port, Puerto Rico. Um, um, each one is different. And many, many of the states already have requirements that you submit every week. Um, where you've applied for work. So you have to apply for qualified work every week and if you've been offered a position. So many states already had this rule in place. So Biden saying it from a federal level, um, it, it, I, as I said, I don't think it's as impactful as uh, I think the media made it sound because most states already had that in place and those that didn't would continue to control their state the, Fed, the federal government there does not control uh, the, the EI benefits there. So much different than in Canada, although in Canada there's similar uh, checks and balances to make sure that you know, people are looking for work. And, uh, I don't think it's as strict if you get an offer, you can't take it here in Canada, but um, there are checks and balances in place in Canada as well. So maybe got a little more press than, uh, than anyone expected, but, uh, but it's not fun unless something's not blown up on social media, right? So uh, uh, moving on here, the U.S. consumers expect near-term inflation bump and medium-term steady outlook. So basically, this goes back to the inflation outlook. We're obviously seeing inflation impact pricing, uh, you know, across almost everything these days. Uh, you know, the, the outlook now is hopefully we're going to see a bit of short-term inflation here or near-term inflation, but then level off a bit in the medium term. So again, this is the uh, the, the U.S. Fed. Uh, looking to spread out the the low rates for at least the three year mark, um, you know they're well into one year of that, so another two years, uh, and and their 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 goal is to keep the medium term inflation low enough that they don't have to go and raise rates. And of course, Canada Bank of Canada's got the same the same strategy going up here as well. Uh, cryptocurrency, uh, Ethereum, sorry, is uh, hitting record highs again. 
Uh, so we've talked about the cryptos a lot, usually talking about Bitcoin. Ethereum's a, a, another one out there, um, probably the second largest one out there. Uh, hit a new highs, uh, Bitcoin off a little bit. Dogecoin slumped. I'm not going to get into Dogecoin. If, if you're not aware of Dogecoin, um, go look at it. Go watch Saturday Night Live from last week. Uh, it, it is, it, to me, it, 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 if you watch me on the regular, you kind of know my position around cryptos. I don't think they're horrible. I do think they're, they're probably overhyped and a lot of challenges around regulatory issues, um, which is why people like them, which is why the governments don't. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, when you have something like, like Dogecoin um, rally, and I can't remember how many thousands of percent it had rallied up in six months or, or some period of time, um, and, and you actually know what it is, uh, it kind of takes credibility away from the cryptocurrencies. And I don't want to do that. I, I do think there's credibility to cryptocurrency, not necessarily in its current state, uh, but Dogecoin is a whole other story. So if you're aware of it, have a chuckle with me. If you're not, go look it up. It's worth a, it, it, it's, it's a chuckle or, or have, uh, have a, a, a teenager or, or um, explain it to you. Um, my kids laugh at it all the time. Um, but anyway, something for you to, to do some research on your own. There you go. Uh, U.S. Insurance Actuary Groups uh, are backtracking a bit on some changes to the protection languages. Uh, and this goes back to the previous conversation about the insurance companies. Um, you know, they're really looking at uh, their whole platforms, uh, all their protection language in their contracts. Uh, insurances are, are what we call a unilateral contract meaning once it's written, you can make changes to it or you can request changes to it, but the insurance company cannot. They are locked into whatever they, they, they agreed on with you. They were looking at making some changes in, in their protection languages, uh, but they've backed away against some pressure uh, on that front, especially around the home and, and car um, insurance premium uh, and policies. So COVID, how's it going? Uh, obviously I mentioned India, the, the situations there are still Still at record highs. Uh, the Canadian numbers have started to improve. We've seen that pretty steadily over the last few weeks. Uh, there's obviously a lot of a lot of concern. I mentioned earlier here, you know, this this herd immunity. Um, you know, we have to be careful, uh, which I do agree with. Uh, and I and and, and I'm going to take the fact that I'm not a scientist or a doctor, uh, you know, uh, out of the equation because I don't think it's necessarily uh, about that. Uh, you know, I think the concern that they're trying to manage, and, and we've seen this in the United States, uh, we're seeing it around the world. I saw some photos from uh, from Spain uh, where they reopened, and some photos in Greece where they reopened the beaches, uh, where uh, people people have so much pent up need to get out there that as soon as you know they reopen, if it's a full like yes, you can go do this, people are just going way overboard, right? Like they're going extreme close quarters partying uh you know <laughs> trying to catch up as much as they can for what they've missed on in the last year plus uh and obviously that's dangerous right you know so i can see why uh you know what we're hearing out there from the experts and the doctors and and and, and the regulators um basically saying listen we got to do this slowly we've got to take you know we've got to continue we've got to keep our foot on the gas pedal because you know, flipping that switch can be dangerous because people people have shown that they're going from zero to a hundred really quickly uh, when they're given the opportunity. So uh, I do, and I don't blame either side. I'm I'm with I'm with everybody with the cabin fever. I you know I can't wait to uh, you know to, to to have some of these things lifted. You know the idea of traveling. All these things, um, you know, people I, I think uh, are getting that itchy finger um, to get out there and do, uh, which is why, you know, I think we're going to see this this continued cautious approach to reopening, um, which I know is is, is frustrating for everybody, uh, but I can I can see that side of it. You know, when you look at what's going on, when you look at the reopening, uh, there are still there still are at risk people. Uh, yes, we're approaching the 50% vaccination rates, you know, in many countries and, and, and going above that, um, you know, and hopefully get into that herd immunity. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about our local uh, communities. It's about the global communities uh, and how that looks and, 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 and how that, you know, it continues to remain uh, a threat 
to taking a huge step backwards. So uh, yes, the numbers are good. I don't mean pessimistic. I just kind of wanted to paint this and, and kind of my take it as my point of view. I love to hear your your point of view. As I said, uh, any comments or feedback, um, you know, are always welcome. Uh, I, I, you know, only through only through conversation can uh, can we kind of grow and and, and learn uh, new perspectives about these things. But uh, but overall, definitely improvements. The vaccines continue to roll out. I looked up this morning. I think here in BC, we're now at age forty plus uh, are on the appointments list uh, and that continues to open up almost a decade a week so uh, moving along very quickly on that front I think Trudeau came out this morning and and, and kind of said we're definitely going to have a one vaccine uh, summer uh, meaning everybody uh, will have had the opportunity to have at least one vaccination uh, or their first shot uh, before the end of the summer uh, hopefully that's even sooner than that in some provinces uh, knock on wood here, um, and uh, and others in, in Ontario. Obviously, they've suffered um, a lot in Quebec as well. So uh, hopefully, that continues to roll out just as quickly. Let's take a look at the U.S. The Labor Department's uh, monthly uh, jolt numbers, uh, jolt numbers survey coming out. The job openings and labor turnover survey is scheduled to release, so we'll get a better idea of uh, uh, what the jobs are showing. We are looking for some good numbers uh, for March, uh, where they had. You know, since March, where they had rose um, to a two-year high in February, although the April new job numbers wasn't great, um, uh, that's not necessarily a negative. One month doesn't make a big change in the trend. Uh, we are looking for that trend to continue to improve uh, as we continue to move through the reopening and getting back to whatever this new state that we're going to open into. Uh, Electronic Arts is expected to report a, a good four-quarter earning, uh, also known probably better known as EA. Uh, they're known for their um, FIFA uh, um, console gaming and Madden NFL games uh, that come out every year. Uh, but they also did two acquisitions, uh, Codemasters and Glue Mobile, so expanded their lineup. So we're going to hear about their earnings, but that's expected to do well as more and more people through the pandemic move to the gaming environment for entertainment and uh, a lot of state, a lot of... Uh, you know, people have, um, you know, even as things are reopening, uh, are continuing to enjoy, um, you know, their games and still spending money in that, uh, that, that area. Obviously, it's a form of entertainment that can be done at home, regardless of movie theaters and that are opening. Uh, and a lot of people have also become attracted to the social aspect of, of, of uh, being online with people. Uh, and I know my kids have told me for a decade that uh, they can hang out with their friends online. And uh, so, you know, that, that area, I think, will continue to grow and expand. Uh, top news out of the U.S., of course, if you haven't been following the, uh, the, the pipeline, um, had the, the cyber attack in the United States that uh, shut down the ransomware that caused the turnoff, I should say. It didn't actually shut down one of their main pipelines, but did force them to shut it down as a pre preventative measure. And we're actually seeing uh, shortages now or uh, empty pumps uh, in the southern states. So um, depending on how that uh, develops, uh, and there's been talks of a second pipeline that might have to shut down, there could be some severe shortages of fuel in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, and that's why a criminal hacker um, group called DarkSide uh, and dark side doesn't have any uh, political affiliation. It's not they prior to this, they've they've come out that they're not political. Um, they don't have no uh, they have no allegiance other than money. That's all they're after. That they put out an announcement saying they're only they only do their attacks for money. So um, I guess that's the, the silver line in there, and and that they did the preventative shutdown. So uh, the, you know the pipeline is not shut out from the ransomware, um, they, they did a preventative shutdown. Uh, it's just whether they can get it back up in time to prevent more and more shortages. Uh, the US Attorney General's uh, urging Facebook to cancel their plan of Instagram for younger kids, a rollout of a new, a new offering for kids under the age of 13, which sounds intuitive, that's probably a bad idea, uh, but you know, I'm over 50, so you know, technology. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously with all the challenges that young people uh, suffer from, uh, there's a lot of benefits. I'm not bashing social media, 
um, because you know it has it has broadened uh, and, and brought a lot of opportunity uh, for a lot of people. But at the same time, there has been a lot of challenges. Um, everything from cyberbullying to screen time, you know, a parent struggle with uh, predators, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, to open something specifically for uh, kids under 13, obviously, um, the uh, attorney generals in, in the United States and probably a lot of people uh, would look at that and think, you know, I, there needs to be a lot more thought around that before it opens up uh, and to make sure that the right protections are in place and that the kids are safe. Um, uh, you know, older teens obviously struggle tons and tons and tons with social media. Um, and uh, you'd hate to see that start at an even younger age. Uh, because right now, I think there are protections in place that kids under 13 are not supposed to be on some of these social media sites. Uh, although I'm sure a lot of them uh, lie and get on there anyway. Uh, weak US bookings have hurt Merit's profits. Well, I, of all the headlines, that's the least surprising to me right now. Um, so obviously uh, the hotel chains are still continuing to suffer. Uh, China, as I mentioned, is, is starting to see a bit um, earlier emergence from the uh, pandemic shutdowns. They did reopen or start to reopen sooner. Of course, they went into the shutdowns before earlier, so no big surprise there. Uh, you were probably going to continue to see this from the hotels, uh, at least for the next quarter, obviously with people not traveling as much. However, as I, do, I have mentioned, uh, I do think you know if you're going to look at a recovery investment into uh, the hospitality uh, are arena or travel arena uh, or sectors, uh, I, I do think the hotels are probably the ones I would favor first uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, they're very diverse when it comes to reasons people travel, business, pleasure, conferences. Uh, they also, of course, there's real assets, the real estate behind some of them. Uh, so just make sure you know what you're buying, you're, whether you're buying the the property or the management company, they're two different things, um, or both in one. Uh, so, you know, it's, but it's not over, right? They, they're obviously, they've been closed. Uh, there's still a lot of countries out there with complete closures on, uh, on, on travel other than business right now. And obviously limited stays at the hotels uh, when you are there. So uh, no surprise on that front. Iraq has formally asked to buy $350 million uh, of stock from uh, Exxon. Uh, so Exxon has a big hold in, in one of their uh, biggest oil fields, uh, Western uh, Kurna One, um, which is a state-run uh, oil operation. And uh, Exxon has a big ownership of that. So Iraq is looking to buy that. Uh, and obviously with uh, foreign countries like Iraq, um, or, or anywhere when you're talking about resources or metals or minerals, um, you know, there's always that fine line between, uh, you know, do you sell, do you cooperate, uh, or, you know, you're at risk that they just nationalize an asset, uh, which we've seen in, in different, and not that this is a big risk right now, but, um, you know, obviously it's something that's going through Exxon's mind. Uh, to take a look at that and the valuation around that. I'm sure there's a lot of negotiations that will continue there. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on, see what happens with that, uh, with that negotiation. Uh, and the U.S. is, is mulling over the uh, end in their Jedi cloud project amid uh, Amazon's court battle. So if you remember, we talked about this last year. Uh, there was a big cloud contract that went up. Uh, I think it was $10 billion over 10 years. Um, that uh, the U.S. government put up that went to uh, Microsoft uh, and Amazon felt it was unfairly directed there by uh, the Trump administration. Uh, specifically, Trump obviously did not like Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, uh, who also owns the Wall Street Journal, um, and they didn't write favorably about him. So uh, there was a court case going on that that was an unfair uh, unfairly awarded contract that Microsoft was clearly not the, the lead bid or, or uh, infrastructure to uh, to provide that. So the Pentagon is is reviewing that and, and mulling over where, whether it's worthwhile to avoid the litigation that might go Amazon's ways regardless uh, and just uh, reopen the contract again. So uh, obviously, if it reopens, is a big win for Amazon to get another kick at that uh, kick at that cat. 
uh, and see if they can't get that business. Uh, obviously not great for Microsoft uh, as that was a big win for them back when they were awarded that. Up in Canada, uh, uh, not a ton going on right now, uh, but uh, as we've talked about over the last few weeks, a lot of uh, M&A, especially in the cannabis space, um, TrueLeave is uh, going to buy Harvest Health for $2.1 billion. Uh, and this continues to be uh, the expansion into uh, U.S. distribution uh, for, for cannabis as more and more eyes turn to a federal uh, legalization, or at least a lightning of a federal uh, de-legalization of cannabis in the United States. Uh, obviously, uh, opens up a lot of markets uh, beyond the individual state-run um, businesses or distribution that's currently in place. On the quantity front, to mention, uh, oils uh, continues to hold strong and, and uh, creep up slightly. Uh, oil still staying with it. Sorry, got, uh, gold still staying within its normal range as we see inflation holding steady right now. Uh, but you know, continued worries around inflation uh, are ratcheting up further and further, especially on the global front. So let's take it. We'll look at bulls versus bear, and what we're seeing out there. So basically, uh, you know, what we saw last year is a massive quantitative easing, uh, you know, dumping of money into the economy to keep it liquid, uh, to keep it stable through uh, what was essentially a shutdown. Uh, and of course, that was worked out great. Uh, the economy stayed buoyant. Uh, we managed to uh, obviously recover valuations in the markets, even hit the new highs. And we also saw a lot of money flowing into new businesses and new industries as, as they adapted to the, the, the closures. Obviously, technology at the forefront, uh, which has, has, has driven uh, a lot of growth and continues to drive a lot of growth in the market. However, a lot of, a lot of views right now, especially in the last five months, uh, is, has been, are the valuations too high? Uh, ha have things gone, gone up too quickly, too, um, too aggressively, uh, while we're still in the middle of a pandemic? We still have a lot of closures. There's still a lot of uh, risk out there, uh, as you know, the vaccines, as I mentioned earlier, still, still nowhere near the herd immunity, but accelerating. So where are we are, are on that front? So there's a kind of kind of your brief concern side. On the other side, we also have some pretty historically low uh, cost of borrowing or liquidity in the market. Uh, we also have trillions of dollars sitting on the sideline. A lot of that money that flew in the market or flew into the economy last year is still sitting on the sidelines. So it's it's not it hasn't moved in despite the record number. Uh, of dollars that flowed into the equities in the past uh, in the past year, um, a lot of that money still on the sidelines. So, uh, you know, what does that mean for this year? Uh, and, and if we look at this year as kind of a, you know, what's been going on, we've continued to see a little bit of growth, despite all indicators. We've continued to see growth, a lot of volatility so far in 2021, uh, but we've continued to see growth in those growth sectors, in those high valued sectors. And, and we're seeing good performance in, in kind of the more fundamental value, intrinsic valued cash flow companies. We're, we're seeing growth there, but not as much as the other side yet. Less volatility, good growth, but not as much as the growth side. So when is that going to flip or will it flip in, in 2021? And that's kind of the debate we're seeing out there right now. Where, Basically, my belief is we're going to see that flip. The money is now shifted over to more infrastructure spending, more longer term growth spending. Uh, we, we've got historical cheap dollars to borrow out there. Uh, that doesn't mean the growth sector is going to go away. It's going to continue to show this volatility. It's going to continue to show highs and lows. Uh, throughout this year. So, you know, if you're in the growth side of the market uh, and, and, you know, you still like it, it just be prepared to be far more active, uh, trade more, take profits, wait for pullbacks. It's going to take some patience uh, and a lot of guts when we see pullbacks in that, that side of the market. That inflationary pressure, though, is always going to be lurking right around the corner for the, for the growth companies. Um, they, they, you know, they will, they, they will eventually uh, succumb 
to uh, inflation when it starts to, to push really hard on rates. And that's where those value companies or those cash flow companies are, are going to shine. They're going to be lower volatility. They're going to have really good growth as they continue to grow this year. Uh, and, and, and if you want some peace of mind in your portfolio, that's where you want to look to, to start to build. If you don't already have some in there, start to build more. Um, you know, keep an eye on when you are taking profits is to take some of those profits and move them over to that cash flow, some of that value side of the portfolio. Uh, and that's what's going to give you peace of mind as we go through that this volatility this year. But also, uh, as we come out and head into that inflationary market, those are the ones that you want to have uh, backing up your portfolio and to ensure that you're, you're not succumbing to that inflationary risk that's, uh, that's going to have pr the pressure on the growth side of the portfolios down the road. So, uh, it, you know, value isn't that cheap out there, though, right? Uh, these companies have seen growth. Uh, so pricing uh, your entry point is, is very, um, should be very targeted. Uh, don't jump in both feet. Um, you know, there are times in the market to take advantage of, uh, of certain pricing or even a, an idea, a, a good name. Uh, but I really recommend kind of easing into the market. Uh, the last few months, uh, we've been incredibly slow to, uh, you know, send 100% of cash into market, uh, even if that money is, is geared for equities, uh, simply because uh, we're looking for the right entry points, we're looking to ease into uh, positions, because even the good positions are going to have pullbacks. And remember, volatility that we're seeing out there, a uh, day like today where we're seeing some negative numbers, that's your friend, that's your ability to take advantage of positions you want to get into doesn't mean you're timing just simply buy some more add into it pick up some more positions as we see pullbacks uh, deploy some more cash uh, and get it working for you the volatility that we're going to see this year is going to be your friend when you talk when you go look back at your returns for uh, for 2021 both on the value and the growth side on the growth side don't be afraid to sell into good news if you see a big spike on good news, don't be afraid to take that money off the table. You're never going to get the high, uh, but you will see another pullback if you want to revisit that name down the road. Uh, or maybe you just you know, are, are happy with the returns you got from it and, and put some of that to work over into your value names. But the, 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 real, um, the real power for 2020 is to be diversified. Uh, if, you, if you've been with me for a long time, you know this is always in our portfolios. Uh, we always have a good, strong diversification in there. Uh, but this year, more than ever, you can, you can be in a year la like last year where a pure growth portfolio did well and didn't hurt you. Uh, but this year, uh, if you're not diversified across value and growth, momentum and value, those two, you know, the polar opposite sometimes in markets, and if you don't have that diversification this year, I think you're going to face a lot of trouble or certainly you're going to face a lot of stress uh, as you see your portfolio um, uh, move in, in ways and, and in uh, percentages that might, uh, might be beyond the risk levels that you're comfortable taking. If you're comfortable with it, you know, uh, you know just be very targeted about uh, uh, the names you're going into and the prices you're paying. Uh, but most people, you know, are looking to, so really bring that volatility line down, and that's where the diversification is really going to pay off for you this year. So that's what I have on the bulls versus bears right now. Again, if you want to discuss anything specific to your portfolio, opportunities that you want to uh, look at, give us a call. Go to mikeonmoney.com. Happy to chat uh, and looking forward to hopefully seeing people again uh, later this year. Until next week, uh, take care of yourselves. Enjoy that sunshine. Thanks, all.